And uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mario Longoria. I'm a community scholar, uh, attended University of Texas uh, quite a year in San Antonio, uh, several years, uh, recently receiving a doctorate of philosophy in English. However, my background is history. I'm a war historian, a sports historian, dealing primarily with the Mexicano, Mexican American, uh, within the, uh, the, I guess, the sequence of history, of American history, and the, their omission or their downplay as such. That's the emphasis I, you know, that, I, uh, that I place on that. The, most recently, I had uh, the exhibit at the Institute of Texan Cultures on the uh, Mexico's 201st Fighter Squad in World War II, which is, again, little known and so forth, that actually was uh, on exhibit for about eight months or so. And the, uh, the work that I've done over the, over the years and so forth, you know, touches upon, for example, the Guy Gavaldon uh, information you saw in the video, the uh, Felix Longoria affair, the uh, discrimination after death, I think they called that particular episode, and the, uh, and the, oh, the Puerto Rican uh, 65th Infantry Regiment uh, history. So. Glad you all are, are here, and uh, at this point, we would like to field questions from the audience. Um, I just got a note that I'm okay. going to repeat my intro because the audio didn't work in the back. <laughs> uh, my name is Patricia Portales. I teach English, uh, Composition, and Literature at San Antonio College. My name is Mary Ann Bueno. I am a historian. I have taught history at the University of Minnesota and the University of North Texas, and I'm currently working on a book project about Mexican Americans in World War II. And my name is Mario Longoria, the community historian, uh, or community scholar and historian uh, associated with the University of Texas here in San Antonio. Um, we, we can make a few more connections if you'd like us to, but we, all, we wanted you to think about any questions that you may have um, about this documentary. Um, our purpose here tonight is to have you view it and then uh, for us to respond to it, but we didn't uh, want to lecture about it. We wanted to make sure this is a community discussion. Or, may, or maybe we should ask the, uh, the audience some questions in terms of what they saw, what they felt, uh, what they could relate to, and uh, things were maybe very interesting. Yes, sir. Just two quick points. I've served. One of the things I found rather hard was this. They sent me and my comrades overseas for liberty and democracy. And they see these things happening and they say, well, why don't you begin with your own family? And it's hard to explain that. And the second part comes from here. Now, uh, to see Germany, after I got out of the Marines, I was with the Army, and the brigade I was in, a lot of times we'd be operating in Central America. So me and the other guys, since my Spanish was kind of poor, they were helping me with my Spanish. So one of the sergeants comes up there and he's telling me, you can't speak Spanish. I go, yeah, I can't. Oh, no, you can't. But I take one side and go, what's wrong? You're acting weird. He goes, no, you're talking about me. I go, no. So I told them, picture this, we're going down into Panama, we're in the town, none of them can speak English, how are we going to let them know we're the good guys? Think about it. But there was that fear because they hear them speaking German or another language, and they didn't bother them. But for some reason I never understood, but they heard me and the guys speaking Spanish with the thought. So some of the things that they mentioned in uh, World War II I could relate to, it wasn't huge, Every once in a while, to me, it was the irritating. It's like, dude, I'm with you. I'm always by your side. I always got your back. We were in Germany together on the border, and now all of a sudden, you're acting weird. How do you explain that? The, there, is, they, they could, there could be a simple explanation to your, to your question there. You know, I would call that, it's a, it's a stigma. It's a historical stigma that's been attached to the, to the Mexicanos, you know, so to speak, within the history of the United States. It hasn't gone away. You know, it's still there. It just assumes different forms or different ways of presenting itself, depending on the circumstances that you're involved in. So it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's still with us. You know, it's not, you know we, we could explain it personally, but as a, but as a people, you, because, of the, because of the fragmentation and the division, it would be hard to kind of make a political statement on that. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, I relate to what you were saying earlier, so that, uh, in the, uh, and even in the Vietnam conflict or the Vietnam War, 
the Mexicanos would actually, at uh, going to what they call R and R, would meet at places like in Hong Kong or in Singapore and that sort of stuff, and they would gather basically for protection. Now, even though we were all soldiers and sailors and Marines and and Coast Guard and so forth, there was still the the fact that you. you when you were on the front line and you were, you were standing and watching that sort of stuff, everything was okay. But once you got away from that, then all of a sudden, all those little, those little uh, Ill's illnesses that uh, they've been plaguing our society for so long seemed to all of a sudden surface once again. Okay? And that also resulted, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was a lot of racial tensions and a lot of racial conflicts. Uh, while the service, within, well, the, while I was there, I was there in 68. While, the, while I was there, that you had to form alliances with the blacks and that sort of stuff. And they even had problems with the blacks also because they thought you were Anglo. Okay. So you were the Mexicano was, there, was caught there between a, hard, a rock and a hard place, and then you had to fend for yourself. And then when you did it, you did it successfully, you were punished. So. Can I ask, sir, when did you serve? Uh, with the Marines, I was with a helicopter squadron in Virginia. When? What time period? Uh, 79 to 81. To 81. And then in 82, I thought I was going to go to school and this army guy showed me pictures of Germany. I thought, oh, cool. So it was 82 to 87, so uh, I was there 83 to 85. Mm -hmm. And then in 87, before the wall came down. Mm -hmm. So I got to wow. see the old Germany slowly becoming the new Germany. But like I said, the one guy, First he was shocked. You're one of them? Yeah. What do you mean I'm one of them? No. I didn't know you were Mexican. And that I, blew my mind. I was just wondering when you served, because during the 80s, the U.S. was involved in a lot of um, secret wars in Central and South America. And I think because of what uh, Dr. Longoria said, that Mexicans, Latinos, have often been considered as permanent outsiders in this country and not necessarily accepted. And so I think what we saw happening in the 80s was also this mass flux of immigrants coming in from Central and South America. And so I think oftentimes, because we were in Central and South America as a military, um, some people could perceive um, perhaps Latino soldiers making alliances with those that they were working against in Central and South America. Um, and perhaps maybe not feeling as safe. And again, because the, the status of per permanent outsider, not necessarily seen as trustworthy as no, other. No, not so much as that, because, uh, well, the only way to describe that period of time is when we described Nicaragua and El Salvador, it was in one country, the good guerrillas are fighting the bad government. In the other country, the bad guerrillas are fighting the good government. Now trying to figure out which one's which. So they knew these guys down there weren't Mexicans. And we were Americans, but it just came down to this strange feeling of we had to be talking about them because we're talking in Spanish. It's like, no, my Spanish isn't very good. And uh, if we end up down there in uh, say Panama, you're gonna want someone that's gonna be able to make it easier to get along with people so they don't see us as uh, the ugly Americans, but great guys. But if we can't speak their language, we can't expect them to speak ours. And you always keep on telling me, you're in America, speak English. Well, when we're down there, I guess we better speak Spanish, no? But it was just like Jekyll and Hyde to me. Mm -hmm. But as far as thinking about any of us having alliances with the Nicaraguans or the El Salvadorians, Nah, they pretty well knew it was just two separate groups. But uh, I never heard that come up. As far as Nicaragua went, it was like, uh, it was supposed to be like a secret war. It was like, yeah, right. <laughs> the only ones who don't know if you have people down there is the American people. The rest of the world know there's, uh, what would you say? Uh, some American soldier got lost and found himself in Nicaragua and decided to start shooting with the Contras. One of the things we wanted, uh, you know, when Dr. Longoria talked about uh, historical stigma, social stigma, um, you know, there's so many contradictions because this, this film can give so much more context. I think Dr. Bueno is going to discuss this. 
But one of the things uh, that occurred that links us to the idea of the image of South Americans or Latin Americans was a good neighbor policy, which, which started well before World War II, that even extended into the way that Hollywood would depict uh, Latinos in film. So this is why, um, you know, if you look at, at 1930s uh, and 40s films, there's so many that are set in Latin American countries where, uh, you know, the idea of like Carmen Miranda sprang from that. But it was to make sure that that image was improved, but then there were so many contradictions that came later. Uh, lady, lady in the blue t-shirt. Lady in the blue t-shirt had a question. The, uh, looking at the, uh, the Zuzu riots of that 19, I think 42, I think it was. The, yeah, it, you know, that, that, that gives you a big picture of how the Mexicanos were, view, were viewed, particularly when they dressed themselves the way they did. Okay? They took a lot of pride in that and so forth, but the, they just weren't accepted. The, the, uh, you know, there's also a correlation there to what the phenomena of the Macintosh suit which was something that also is very, looks very similar to the way the tailoring is done on the pachuco, on, their, their, on the drapes, on, the, on their suits and so forth, that had a, uh, a uh, how should I say, a, uh, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm lost for words in terms of, uh, uh, it meant something. It meant that you were successful and it meant that because you dressed well and so forth, you felt well, the dress for success type thing, I guess for the lack of a better, uh, a better description. <coughs> Uh, in San Antonio during that time, the, uh, in the South Texas, the Mexicanos were just scurrying around back and forth in and out of the military, basically. The, uh, the only incident that I recall historically in San Antonio that involved a large group of Mexicanos pertaining to, to wanting to protest the conditions that they lived in uh, was many years prior to that. So the, uh, the only connection there is basically the, the Mexicano image and what it meant to the, the Lingos or the Anglos at the time. And then, depending on where you were at, it was, uh, it was dealt a certain way, you know, or whatever the circumstances permitted. I don't know of any um, similar incident that occurred here in Texas, but the racialized violence that Mexicans experienced in this country in the early 20th century was really quite horrific. And a lot of the violence that happened here in Texas really man manifest in South Texas in particular with the lynching of Mexicans. And there is a time period between about 1800, 1880s and the 1930s where more Mexicans were lynched in Texas than African Americans were lynched in the whole U.S. South. Um, and so in, in the wake of that, that lynching and that racialized violence, Mexicans, Latinos were joining the armed forces by the thousands and African-American soldiers, not necessarily um, zoot suiters, right, because the zoot suit culture was very, it was very much a black culture as well, but African-American soldiers experienced so much racialized violence against them uh, during World War II when they were stationed in the U.S. South in particular. And this was black women soldiers as well as black men. And um, so it didn't even have to be about wearing something that signified otherness but it just was about the, the racialized tension and, and the way racial formations in the early 20th century manifested in a, in a moment of war. And also, uh, one thing we like to add is, uh, Dr. Catherine Ramirez has a book out called The Woman in the Zoot Suit. And she uh, really uh, investigated and did some oral histories with um, the women who were the girlfriends of the young men who were in the Sleepy Lagoon trial. And um, in those oral histories, she asked them questions about how they would adapt their boyfriend's jackets over their skirts that were shorter, 
um, about how that created tension generationally because you know the older generation didn't like that they were wearing that you know even though it was meant to be like an empowering uh, piece of clothing but she asked them things about you know uh, myths about their hair for example they would say that the women would uh, create pompadours in their hair so high that the that the myth was that they had they hid blades inside their hair and she asked them if they did that and I remember in her book she says that one of them laughs and says no we would have cut our own scalps we didn't have any <laughs> blades in our hair but she also discusses how the women those those women the girls or the girlfriends of the Sleepy Lagoon Charlie Young Men were sent to um, a correctional girls school and because they weren't actually charged with anything uh, they they were kind of forgotten you know no one ever went back to get them removed from that school in the way that the young men had gone and been acquitted. And not only that, but the Pachucas, uh, they, didn't re they didn't go through a trial, there was no judge, there was no jury, and they, were, uh, they remained wards of the state until they were 21 years old. So they, you know, the implication of just even being a Pachuca could mean time away from the family. I, th and then I think that What about previously to that, and especially in Germany? Because before they actually started knowing that they were rounding up the Jews and in massacre, they had gay other groups, and that included blacks, Latinos. And I'm just wondering, like, first of all, what are you doing in Germany at that time? And I know it was a, Berlin was like the great site for everything um, artistic, learning, um, education, but that was one of the groups and the mentally impaired that they were taking out of institutions and killing them. So do you know anything about what exactly was going on, how they ended up in Germany, such a large number? I don't recall the, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, it's usually related to war. The Mexican participation in Europe, in Germany, for example, World War One and World War Two. Although I think there was very few battles fought in Germany in World War One, the only example that I remember in terms of how the Mexicano was treated differently from everyone else involved a, uh, a soldier here from San Antonio who served in the, during the time of Sergeant York, which would be a little more, uh, I guess, a little more familiar with everyone. And uh, he was also credited with capturing, I think, close to 68, uh, 68 or 64 Germans. He was also, he was, uh, he had, uh, he initially was, uh, they said his officer, the officer right above him, but the officer above him was a little different, had submitted him for, uh, for the Congressional Medal of Honor based on the, what he had accomplished in a, in a, in a, in a series of battles with, uh, with the Germans. And he was, he was a United States uh, Army uh, serviceman, okay? And it was turned down the very next day by, the, uh, by his commanding officer because that particular gentleman could not speak or write English. So and he didn't want someone to receive a medal of that, of, of that honor to someone who could not read or write English. And that was what he was turned down for that. He wa eventually wound up receiving after a few battles after that he wound up receiving the Distinguished Service Cross, which is second only to the Medal of Honor. Now, connected to that, in terms of how I see it, is the, uh, is the German population in Texas. Okay? The, I remember from our situation, my dad used to refer to them as the uh, cuadrados, which meant square heads, because that's how they cut their hair. And uh, how difficult it was for them to, in the workplace, and also in social places and then social interactions and so forth, there was a huge disparity there in terms of how they, tr how they treated each other. Could I, just, I, I know that they mentioned that the first group that Hitler wanted to get rid of, like I say, was in the um, people that were meant to be impaired, and they mentioned Latinos, and it was like some from Puerto Rico, and I'm just curious because that was soon after um, the first war, and Germany was so poor, you know, um, they, and that's really what started setting off going into World War II, besides, you know, Hitler feeling that, you know, they shouldn't have to be paid 
money back. And mm -hmm. So that's why I was just kind of like, that was a huge mixture. But those were some of the first ones that they, um, if they could tell, well, of course you could, you know, the, from the different backgrounds. And those were the first ones that they had astronomy. And it, you know, it all boils down to the, uh, the Holocaust. The, uh, the treatment of the Native Americans, Mexicanos. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I should have told. I should have mentioned this at the very beginning. Whenever I start to talk about certain aspects of the war, can I return to that question shortly? Yeah. I think I saw a hand up over here. Yeah. When I was young, I always heard my older brother talk about Chicano power and what that was about. You're asking all of us? Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. There you go. I mean, it's like I always heard him, and then there was something about brown and reds. Brown and reds, yeah. Well, Usually what we like to discuss is that, you know, even though people can think of uh, things that happened in the late 60s, early 70s with like the Chicano moratorium or the civil rights movement, um, those actions really had so many predecessors. So one of those catalysts was what's, what we saw here in the film that returning soldiers would uh, not want to be treated as second class citizens. So that preceded that, but um, Chicano power was part of the uh, Chicano movement in the 70s, it was very nationalistic. There was lots of connection to, uh, you know, reminding people that, for example, South Texas was once part of Aslan, ancient land of the Aztecs. Uh, it was a very nationalistic movement. So, really saying we're Mexicans, but we're, 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 we with the politicized identity. That's that's what I always tell my well, my students. Because, I, mean, I, I can refer to it as Bennett, you know, oh, here. You can bought, you can put other and you can write in Chicana, which is what I do. <laughs> the, that, that in itself has a quite a remarkable or remarkable history in terms of the development of that, that particular identification. You know, Mexican American, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Spanish surname, uh, and you can go on and on and on and on. The, the term Chicano actually has some historical basis for that stuff. You know, the, uh, although a little on the flimsy side, but uh, the, uh, I, it was, this is, I'm gonna share this with you because it was explained to me years ago because I called myself a Chicano for the longest time because that's the word, the common word that was used in the neighborhood. You know, Chicano this, Chicano that, and that sort of stuff. It was just part of our vocabulary. Okay. Yeah. And, when I got into the military, you know, you run into other, uh, you know, other, other, other Mexicanos and Chicanos and so forth, and they use the term just as freely as I did back then. See, but, uh, the thing is, I mean, I was born in, in Texas, and on my birth certificate it says white. Mm -hmm. No, you're Caucasian. <laughs> the, yeah, that was, that's a, that's a story, another story also. I went back when I when I when I when I found that out and uh, when it finally re I came to it came to me I had this realization that okay what does Chicano really mean you know well he said it means that you're you're Mexican you know you're you know you live with other Mexicans you work with other Mexicans you know you have a Mexican culture you have all this it means all those things see to some degree or another see. Is it, but why is it that someone else who looks just like me, speaks like me, and sort of doesn't call himself that? And then it turned out to be, well, it became a badge of uh, a courage, I guess, or a, a badge of identification, saying, well, I'm a Chicano because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I need to do for what is necessary for wherever I'm at. And that sort of, so it became that, uh, and the word Chicano became kind of flourished a little bit during the 60s, during the Chicano movement, so forth. And then you already run into some of these older veteranos from the, from in the neighborhoods that show up 30 or 40 years after they've been gone, and they still call themselves Chicanos. So it wasn't just Texas, it was yeah. It's just an identity you want to assume because it make you, maybe it uh, gives you a, a euphoric feeling of who you are. Or you're, you want to be associated with, with that particular group because maybe some of the things they've done or accomplished or some of the things that they've confronted. 
You know, so it, it you know it has many it has many meanings. Right. Well, it, what, for example, you know, as as a politicized term, um, it had its own conflicts. When I was talking earlier or about the zoot suits and generationally, that was a problem. Um, of course, I'm sure you've heard that some people say the word Chicano or Chicana is, is a bad word, that it's derogatory. The older generations might have thought that, and then it was appropriated and given that politicized you know, term of power during the 70s. Um, it also brought uh, the idea of ethnic studies, Chicano studies, to ethnic studies to places like UC Berkeley as a form of an, a field of study that was worthy of study, whereas it, it had been ignored before that. Uh, but it, it absolutely does depend on where you are, which group you're in. Um, you know, in, in some places, if you are at you know a, at a campus course that's about Chicano studies, everybody will use that term. If you're somewhere where people are unfamiliar with it or uncomfortable with it, then they'll rely on Hispanic or Latino or Mexican American or whatever they're familiar with. And I'd like to just point out that I think. Um, the terms Chicano and Chicana are much more um, used generally in places like California um, as opposed to here in Texas. In California, at universities across the state, there are departments of Chicano studies. Here in Texas, there are departments of Mexican American studies, right? So it's, it's um, in the Midwest, there are departments of Chicano studies. So it is kind of a geographically uh, specific, but it is much more prevalent um, in California than it is here to be used in institutional settings in particular. And to what she was saying about being classified as white, what do you do, especially older generation, what do you do about your birth certificate? Because that's what you would check out as being white, Caucasian. Racially, People, Latinos are not white. We're mestizos, right? We're mestizas, we're mixed. And again, when I'm asked my race on, on a forum, I check other and I put mestiza because that's what I am. I'm not white. Um, but uh, I think that's something that perhaps I think some of the younger generations um, have been more um, attuned to as opposed to the older generation. They have that option on the birth certificate now, but mm -hmm. they didn't in the past. No. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm not mistaken, years ago, the uh, in the academic community, the discussion in the uh, the genetics field, the uh, the scientists, the uh, the learned, uh, decided that uh, there's only three races in the world: the Caucasian, the Negroid, and the Mongolian, the Mongoloid, rather. Okay? And that's it. Everything was based on that. You know, and that remained the law or the, or the standard for years and years, and they don't use it anymore. But there was nothing mentioned publicly to, uh, to confirm that. Okay? But it's no longer used anymore. I know they ask, uh, they sometimes ask uh, people, say, okay, well, what, is, uh, what is your race? And uh, no, they ask you, what is your nationality? And they'll say their race, or you ask them, what is your race? And they'll give you their nationality or their ethnicity. <coughs> ethnicity. Okay. So that in itself is a is a uh, is a uh, a little uh, a jar of uh, a mixture of stuff that doesn't you know has yet to be redefined a little better in terms of the way the world the way the world is today. But I think it's important to note that in this country, socially, politically, we operate by the one drop rule. Do we know what the one drop rule is? <coughs> right, if we have one drop of African blood in us, we're black. Mexican Americans, Latinos in general, like phenotypically, we're not black. So if we're not black and we're not Asian, then we're by default categorized as Caucasian. And that was based on a, a Supreme Court decision, wasn't it, back in the early 20th century? I had a question on the Mongolia affair. Mm -hmm. uh, one, where where is Three Rivers, and uh, and up to what point did they uh, begin allowing uh, Mexicanos to be buried in that, that cemetery? They don't. They don't. <laughs> it's segregated. Three where Rivers is, is it's 
south of San Antonio, about two hours, uh-huh. more or less, two and a half hours. And if you go to South Texas and walk through most cemeteries, they're still quite segregated. So South Texas is meeting in the valley? No, not that far, Between not that far it's south. Almost. It's more yeah. heading west, northwest. From here, it's uh, trying to, not to find the, in the Uvalde area. Three Rivers? Yeah. Three Rivers, yeah. No, Three no, Rivers no. is south. Oh, south. Yes, yeah. it's south. It's, it's not that far, not that far no. from here. So they have a huge refinery the there. The big uh, Valero refinery is there. It's between here and Edinburgh. Edinburgh. About right. halfway. About not halfway. quite to Alice, Texas. But okay, Alice, between Texas. maybe halfway between here and Alice. A, a couple of years ago, uh, Three Rivers received a historical marker at the Rice Funeral Home stating that the Longoria Affair occurred there. And I, uh, I freelance as a journalist and I was assigned to write about this historical marker. And so I called Three Rivers and I was so flabbergasted to discover that they didn't want to talk about it. They would, they would actually say, why are you still talking about this? Um, or, uh, you know, those people exaggerated and they would hang up on me and I would call back and s- I would try, you know, a couple of city council members or the mayor. And I really was surprised at how much they really just wanted to erase that. I was thinking this can't, I must be on like on a, a prank show or something because they couldn't possibly want to completely erase that. But they were pretty angry about that historical marker. Um, John Valadez, who directed this episode right here, also has a document, a 56-minute documentary like this, called Just the Longoria Affair, and, you know, draws it out much more than this did. But at least they have the historical marker that is there now. Any other questions? I just want to make one other, um, and I'm sure we have many points, but what other connection to San Antonio? Um, during uh, 1939 to 1944, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of an actress whose name was Lupe Velez. Um, she starred in a movie that was, the first one was called The Girl from Mexico. And again, it goes back to that good neighbor policy and you know this um, improved image of Latinos in film. Um, and in The Girl from Mexico, she plays a singer in Mexico in a fictional town and an American man who is a scout looking for a singer goes down there finds her and asks her to come back to New York. Uh, That turned into an eight part series of films that was called The Mexican Spitfire and Lupe Velas was the star in all of that eight part series. And just coincidentally, it ran from 1939 to 1944 and the only reason it stopped in 44 was because she committed suicide, or well there's some controversy about her death. But she has a connection to San Antonio because in, when she was very young, in the 20s, she had been a student at Our Lady of the Lake School, not university, but at the school. Um, and so uh, there's a couple of documents that want to claim her as a, as a San Antonian, although she was only here for maybe one or two years. But uh, Warner Archives um, just released that on DVD about two years ago. So you can get the DVD with the full eight part series the first few films are, they're very silly, they're all comic uh, films, but uh, they're pretty silly, but the later ones, uh, at least the characters, you know, are uh, obviously uh, supporting World War II, they're, you know, the characters are, have, you know, helping the Red Cross and, and doing all of that. Both. They, they entered at their own free will and then uh, were drafted. So, so there was no big campaign to you know, recruit Mexican Americans so And in the, uh, the first, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and this comes from the uh, Raul Morin uh, World War II book, uh, Among the Valiant, uh, he mentions a, a Mexicano by the name of Despart, who is actually one of the, when the, the draft began, he was the first one, he was the first draft when the, when the armed forces were back in the War Department uh, set up the, uh, the draft. The uh, first one was in Mexicano, in Los Angeles. But for the most part, 
they went on their own free will because that was their duty as part of, as being a citizen of the state. And that hasn't changed. Yeah, it hasn't changed at all. I had a friend of mine who was part of that unit. So this documentary covered about 25 years. The <laughs> war students and it's all the way to the Mid House. And it shows women for about three minutes. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> I timed it. <laughs> We did not plant him in the audience, <laughs> but this is one of my major critiques of this documentary. This documentary really does put forth the traditional narrative of Mexican Americans in World War II, and because of, well, there is a vast amount of scholarship these days about Latinos in World War II. The biggest source of information locally is at UT Austin where a professor there, a professor of journalism, Dr. Maggie Rivas um, Rodriguez, has started an oral history collection in the late 1990s, and she has collected with a team of scholars, community members, volunteers, over 900 oral histories with Latinos um, and their, about their experiences in World War II. Of the 900, there are only 10 interviews with women who served during World War II. So in, this is the largest archive, the largest collection about Latinos in World War II. Why Mr. Valadez didn't access that archive a little bit more baffles me because amongst the, the materials collected are beautiful pictures and letters and diaries and photos and posters that the women collected, that the women wrote, that the women took uh, pictures of and there were some of the women who served, that are, their stories are a part of that collection, um, World War II really impacted their lives. And so unfortunately, you know, uh, the documentarian gets to pick and choose what they include in their piece, and Mr. Valadez didn't really access that archive in the way that I felt a documentarian can and should access. Uh, but there were 15,000 Mexican nationals served in the U.S. Armed Forces during World War II, and we only heard one of their stories, you know, Ma 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 Macario. Macario. Mm -hmm. So, as you were the documentary, tell us one story you had. One story? Yeah, give us a story. One so you would add or tell us about any part of that. Sure. Um, one of my favorite World War II stories is this woman, uh, Mary Sally Salazar from Laredo, Texas, who used her sister's birth certificate to join the armed forces during World War II. And she came to San Antonio, she took a bus, she said she was gonna visit family, she enlisted in World War II into the armed forces, she went home, she, um, her enlistment papers came to the house, the postal worker delivered it, and her dad freaked out, her mom freaked out, and her dad wanted to turn her in as somebody who enlisted using somebody else's birth certificate. Her mom got really worried, said, no, 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 please don't, please don't do this to our daughter, she's gonna get in trouble. So her whole time in the service, Maria Sally Salazar went by her sister's name. Her dad ultimately did not turn her in. She served in the, in the Pacific and she was, um, I forgot which island she was on in particular, but she was part of the, um, she saw so much devastation. She saw soldiers coming back from the Philippines after the Bataan death march. She saw the Marines loading up to go um, hit um, Okinawa and the Japanese islands. She was so negatively, devastatingly impacted by her time during World War II. She never really fully recovered physically or even in her mental health wise, but she says straight up in her interview, I would do it 100% again. I have no regrets. It was the time of my life. And her story really always stays with me. And partially because in McAllen, Texas, there's a Texas uh, Veterans Memorial and there's a seven foot tall bronze statue 
of Maria Sally Salazar. And I just, I love that statue. I have pictures taken, you know, by, by it. And that story just always stuck with me because, you know, she lied to her parents. She almost got in trouble, um, but she stuck it through and she had to do all this paperwork and legal work to get her name changed from her military records so that she could access the veteran services like the GI Bill and, and whatnot after the war. So I think she's a pretty cool woman and I think it would have been great to include her picture, her story, and the picture of at least the seven foot tall bronze statue in the documentary. So it sounds so. like the basis for a movie. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. I would uh, include, uh, you know, I, I told you earlier that I collected the oral history of my aunt. Um, and, and what really happens, just like in the film, is that so many, and it, you know, we could say that, of course, uh, the bravery of uh, people who served uh, in the Pacific Theater, the European Theater, and that kind of service deserves all that attention. Um, in my family, my father is the youngest of eight. Um, his two oldest brothers, um, one served on a supplier ship in the Pacific, and the other um, served uh, at Normandy in the Utah section um, on D-Day. And then my aunt was married to a man named Omero Esquivel, who had been um, a Japanese prisoner of war, and that was, that was all I knew. Um, and so when um, I interviewed my aunt, it was originally because they said, you know, ask her about Theo Homer's um, experiences because he had already died. But in doing the oral history, you know, they give you this learn how to interview kit. And the first thing you have to ask is, what were you doing during the war? And when I asked her that, she said, oh, I was welding bombs. And I didn't know that. No one in my family had ever brought it up. I almost fell out of my chair. You know, I just said, why is this not the main story? And then she told me, and then she even said, you know, this is why I have all these scars on my neck because we used to wear the welding mask, but some of the sparks would, you know, fly under it. And she said, you never noticed these scars? And I, I have to admit, I never had. But that information of um, how empowering it was for them, not only to learn new skills, because um, she had only been a domestic worker before that, worked as a housemaid with uh, my grandmother, her mother, um, how empowering it was for them to learn industrial skills, to wear a uniform that they had never, you know, they had never worn pants. She said she was wearing coveralls and boots and a mask, and it really empowered them in different ways. They, her shift was 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. She said um, sometimes they would use those wages. Uh, the women would go together and eat breakfast, I think very um, humorously at a place that she said that was called the Alamo, and that was the name of the restaurant. Um, you know, and I asked her, you know, how was the initial reaction to you working from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m.? And uh, she said, you know, it was actually pretty easy because a lot of women were doing, everybody was, was in that sentiment that we were going to help. So it was pretty easy at the time. But, but kind of, you know, compartmentalized, it was only easy because of that. Had it been just before that or even just after that, she thinks that restriction would have been worse. Well, I think that was part of the campaign was that they wanted people to uh, to say things like, you know, oh well, here we're gonna we're gonna leave this place to give it back to these you know deserving uh, men and soldiers who are returning. So part of the campaign was to teach them that their job was only temporary. But Mexican women worked outside of the home before right. the war and after the war because that was how the family survived, right? And if they weren't working outside of the home before the war, war they were bringing in money in other ways, doing laundry, um, subletting rooms in their homes to renters and whatnot. So right. Mexican women and working, it's always, always, always happened. Especially uh, pecan shelling in San Antonio, which could be done at home. In a in reference to the question the gentleman asked a little while ago about you know the uh, just the, the uh, women you know the the role that women played in such a huge uh, historical span of time there, and I uh, 
I recall that I, I, was, I was working on a project many years ago and I was very interested in the women air service pilots, the WASP. So I decided, I said, there's gotta be some Mexicanos in there soon, you know, there's gotta be some. So I did the research and I found one. Her name was Vernita Rodriguez. She was from uh, Chicago, Illinois. And she wound up flying down here to McAllen and to Brownsville where they would deliver planes to the, uh, their job was primarily, they got taught as pilots and they knew how to fly all the planes that were coming off the assembly line. They were taught the different models and so forth. And then they were all given assignments to fly a certain amount of planes to certain bases around the country on a regular basis as they were, as they were being produced by the, uh, by the, by the manufacturers. And uh, I did, uh, all I was able to find on her was that uh, she was one of the, she, was, she, flew, she flew missions down into Kansas and then down into Texas. But I, I, my research uh, didn't, get in, didn't get far enough to find out exactly what those kinds of missions were and what kind of plane she was flying and such. But there was one Mexicana participant in that particular, also almost forgotten piece of World War II, was the WASP. And I'd like to note that the, um 10 oral histories that the UT Austin holds about Mexican women, Mexican American women who served during World War II is they came back and they were very active in their communities. They were politically engaged with the PTA, with church organizations, with the YWCA, with political campaigns, just as much as Hector P. Garcia was with the GI Forum. And, and at some level, we think only maybe men were the political movers and shakers, but these women, they were on the ground and they were hustling and fighting for their families, for their communities, for themselves, and, the, and their civil and social rights. All right. We really encourage you to go uh, Google Vo Voices Oral History Project at UT Austin. They have a learn how to interview kit, so if any of your family members your elders have uh, those memories from the home front or service. Uh, they will collect it and archive it and it will stay there so that future generations can know about it. And they're collecting not just for World War II but oral right. histories with the Korean War and the v Vietnam conflict. Right. So. We've reached 8.15 so it's the end of our program. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you to our scholars. I want to uh, repeat one more time that this program was brought to us by um, the American Library Association, the National Endowment for Humanities, who received a competitive grant um, for Latino Americans by the years of history. Uh, next week, October 15th, we're going to have another great program. Um, Dr. Enrique Alman, he's the producer of Stolen uh, Education. He will be presenting his documentary that's about the discrimination that Mexican American students faced in the 1950s in Texas, and then the federal court case um, that they testified in. And so that's at Parman Branch Library, October 15th. Yeah.